Hi, my name's David Veal and I'm going to be talking to you today about getting the most from exposure and behavioural experiments in OCD and BDD. And first I want to acknowledge that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and my giants are, well, old white men who I've learned from and want to acknowledge. These include uh, my uh, first trainer, uh, Isaac Marx, and I've also learned from Jack Ratman, Paul Sarkoskis, Paul Mark Freeston, Paul Gilbert, Adam Ludonsky, and many others. Um, and uh, I'm deeply grateful to them. Now, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to assume that you've done the groundwork with your therapist or whoever, and um, that you know some pieces in your jigsaw in terms of the cause of your OCD and BD. And you don't need to spend too much time on this. You just need to recognize that it's not your fault that you have OCD or BD. It's difficult when you're human. Uh, we have a tricky brain compared to reptiles and mammals. And there are very probably well, uh, heritable and genetic predispositions for you towards having this condition. And there are things that will have shaped you during your childhood and early adolescence. All these things are important for the development of your problem. Um, and it's helpful to have some understanding, but you don't need to spend a lot of time on this. The key thing is to have a good understanding of the maintenance of the problem because these are the things that you can now do something about and uh, there are lots of things that you might be able to identify um, that for example it might be uh, processes like wanting certainty uh, um, you may find yourself frequently checking seeking reassurance um, or avoiding situations, or if you have BD, trying to define yourself through your feature. All these are recognized uh, processes um, which are maintaining and keeping the problem going. And as I said, you need a good understanding of these processes because that's going to help to shape what you're going to be doing in the exposure. And the next te step is to test out whether in fact some of these processes are making the problem worse. And of course, I'm then encouraged to test out your predictions and to tolerate these feelings of anxiety. So the next step is to develop that alternative understanding of the problem and then test out how your solutions, for example, avoidance or camouflage are making your problem worse. Uh, it is important to define your problems and goals and to make SMART goals, ones which are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and, and in a particular time frame. And um, to be also aware of some of your values that you're working towards. It is important to be ready to take action, not just uh, to be talking or thinking about taking action. And lastly, it's important um, to ensure that you have the right context to make you feel safe um, and uh, you have the right support, whether it's from your family members or the therapist or whoever. All these are important to help you cross the finishing line and be able to do the things that you need to be able to do. So the terms exposure and response prevention or behavioural experiments are ones that are used by therapists uh, and I want to argue today that they are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, so traditionally the term exposure and response prevention is a term used to describe the deliberate and planned activities that involve facing your fears without any compulsions or safety seeking behaviours where you're learning to tolerate your anxiety. And the term behavioural experiment is about learning to test your predictions. For example, whether your, your, your experience that you've just done in the experiment best fits with one of those two competing theories 
about whether in fact your solutions are making the problems worse. So um, I, I don't want you to get too hung up on you know whether it's exposure task or a behavioural experiment or whatever. They really are both sides of the same coin. And um, it's not about being triggered. Um, it is a planned activity, yeah. Um, and you know, it's it's the carrying out that's the difficult thing, because you know most of what I have to say is not rocket science. It's the doing which is the difficult thing. And I shall evoke uh, Churchill on this. So, uh, remember, when I use the term exposure, I am referring to both uh, exposure response prevention and behavioural experiments. They're just two sides of a coin. And the first thing you're going to be doing is to decide upon what exposure tasks are you going to be doing. And essentially, you would try to choose tasks which relate to what you're avoiding in life, what is value driven or what's important to you and what involves overlearning and these are often referred to as sort of anti-OCD tasks and these are the sorts of things that many people say oh my god that's abnormal I'm not doing that um, and you know these sort of tasks may be abnormal but they're damn good at treating your condition so um, things that are anti-OCD would be, for example, you've got fears of contamination. It might involve touching the toilet seat, rubbing your hands and then your face or transferring it onto somebody else. Um, if uh, you have fears of being violent, then, you know, actually one of the tasks might involve um, agreeing uh, with your therapist to put a knife to their throat and wish or urge yourself to to cut their throat uh, these are all quite normal in the in the world of OCD um, in it, uh, it also if you've got thoughts about being homosexual or something it's very important to be doing normal things like having a heterosexual relationship and not avoiding them uh, because this is part of your values in BDD, it might be important, for example, to do to, to be going out to a swimming pool uh, where you're not camouflaged. Again, it may be that you don't often go swimming or whatever and don't like going swimming, but this is a very good task for your BDD in that particular context. It really depends upon all these tasks depend upon your particular problem and um, what you need to do to be able to get over them. So let's assume you, you've made a list of tasks and you're going about to uh, start on your first one. So it's important that the purpose of the exposure is clear to you. You know, can your therapist or can you explain to yourself exactly the rationale and the purpose of it? Do you have a prediction or expectation to be tested in terms of what it is that you are going to uh, hope to find out and have you decided upon uh, the location where you're going to be doing it when you're going to be doing it 
um, how often you're going to be doing it or any other resources you need to do it and, and lastly any other obstacles that might get in the way and how you're going to solve them. Now you may have heard of the term uh, graded exposure and this essentially means uh, doing things in small steps but the question is you know how graded should exposure be and the reason why I say that is there is a risk of ending up with many small easy tasks which you're not really learning to tolerate the anxiety or to be able to test out your predictions. So yes it's helpful to grade tasks into easy moderate or hard tasks but you know always try to challenge yourself. And more recent research suggests that it's actually more effective if you jump around so that you might start an easy task but also then go to a hard task and jump back down to a moderate one or, and so on. Uh, so if you can, it's best to jump around. So one of the questions often is, well, how long should the exposure task last for? Well, remember that um, exposure, you're learning to tolerate the feelings and doubt. So the elevated fear should be maintained for as long as possible. Um, and you're not waiting for the anxiety to decrease within the session. Uh, the most important thing is really to monitor whether the anxiety decreases between the sessions. In other words, does repeating the task actually get easier and easier? In a pure behavioural experiment, it's, it's just long enough to confirm an alternative explanation. But in general, you know, you're just doing it until you're learning to tolerate those feelings and um, allow yourself to test out whether in fact uh, your prediction is true or not. So the next question is, how often should we, you be doing exposure tasks? Um, well, as a minimum daily. And one of the reasons why uh, I'm not a great saxophone player is because I don't practice enough daily. Um, and in general, <laughs> for exposure tasks, like any learning task, leaving long gaps between exposure means that uh, your fears will return. Um, but, and you know the therapist can act as a guide and supporter but you know much like seeing a physio uh, you have to do the work and uh, as a minimum daily preferably you know several times a day. The next rule is that when you repeat the tasks try to do so in different contexts so for example uh, perhaps to do it now when you're alone uh, without a therapist or a family supporter with you, doing it in uh, unfamiliar places, in different times of the day and so on. So that try to vary the context as much as you can. Now it can be helpful to label the emotion you're experiencing during the exposure. So for example you might be uh, telling yourself that these are the feelings of anxiety or uh, disgust, shame or whatever. But uh, you can encourage yourself in terms of, David, I understand this is tough, this is difficult and so on, but really be careful. We don't want you to be getting into rationalising it and reminding yourself that it couldn't possibly be dangerous or something. Uh, make sure you don't criticise yourself. Um, make sure you're not reassuring yourself, not comparing your feature against somebody else and so on. In general, try to zip it, no chatter, but I'm just saying limit it, if you must, to just labelling the emotion and trying to encourage yourself in a compassionate way. Those, those are the things, the only things you can really be doing in terms of your self-talk. 
Now, after the exposure, you really want to be testing your expectations that you made, your predictions. And so essentially it's like an experiment. You're completing it by reflecting on what you've learnt. You know, for example, did the anxiety last as long as you predicted? How does the outcome best fit what sometimes might be referred to as theory A or theory B? For example, in BED, uh, theory A is that you feel ugly and you feel very uncertain as to how you look. Theory B that you're testing out in your exposure task is that you have a body image problem. and The more you check in the mirror, the more uncertain and ugly you feel. For someone with OCD, let's say the theory A is that you are a paedophile. Uh, but theory B is that you have worries and fears about being a paedophile and that the more that you avoid, the more you lose your confidence and become convinced that you are a paedophile. And so after the exposure task, you are making, uh, t t your you've made your prediction and you're testing out whether it best fits with theory A or theory B. So the next thing about an exposure task to say is that a therapist or a supporter may be there to help model the task first, in other words, for them to do the task first in front of you. Um, or you may just be doing it with your therapist and supporter at the same time. Sometimes you have to be quite creative uh, when you're online. So for example, it may be that you have your phone uh, around your neck and the therapist can see through the camera what you are doing or whatever and helping you to encourage you and to support you in that particular way. So um, all I'm saying is that your uh, sessions with a therapist should include uh, exposure tasks and um, very often they may model it first or do it with you. So the next rule is try to integrate exposure tasks in your everyday activities. Uh, for example, you wouldn't want to avoid a sexual relationship with your partner, even if your uh, unacceptable images pop into your head when you're having sex. Um, and, um, you know, have a knife to hand in the kitchen or whatever when you have the opportunity to stab your family member or whatever. Deliberately try to transfer thoughts and, and worries when you have the opportunity when, uh, to, to kill people off or whatever. So um, try to integrate these exposure tasks into normal everyday activities so that you've got, that you're using the opportunities. Now one of the questions that often people have is about doing exposure in real life as opposed to in imagination. Now, sometimes it can be helpful to do it in imagination, um, uh, especially where you can't do it in real life. And sometimes it can be helpful to externalise the thoughts. So, for example, let's say you've got fears of running people over in your car. Um, you might have, for example, um, a picture from Google Maps where you think you've done an accident and you might have uh, a picture of your car superimposed on it and uh, then you might want to um, put pictures of dead bodies or something around the car so it makes it look it, you're doing exposure uh, by externalizing your very fears. Um, sometimes also people find it helpful to make an image worse um, or like a cartoon so you can laugh at it but uh, you have to be careful here because you don't want to be what we call neutralizing it and undoing it or doing some new ritual. And um, it's too complicated, I think, to discuss today um, how you apply these to sexual thoughts and images. Uh, I know that some therapists will encourage exposure and imagination to their worst fears, like being sent to jail or something. I'm not personally convinced um, about this. It's very difficult to do research into. Um, so in general, when we talk about exposure and imagination, it is really something that's very individual that you really do need to talk it through with a therapist and take care if it's linked to a trauma memory. 
Um, so it's very difficult to give you general advice today about you know what you're going to be doing in exposure and imagination. In general, stick to things that uh, if you're on your own in real life and really talk through what you would be helpful in the rationale um, with your therapist when you're talking about things in, in imagination because it's very uh, specific to you. So it's very important that you are doing tasks without your safety seeking behaviours. So a safety seeking behaviour is anything that you do that is motivated by a desire to escape or avoid from your threat. And so of course what you're trying to do is to gradually remove the things that you do to reduce the anxiety and give you a sense of control and certainty in the short term. So for example in BDD it might be using uh, camouflage on your face because of your fears about what others are thinking. In OCD it might be using gloves to touch a door handle uh, or um, perhaps using a pair of um, handcuffs to stop yourself from being violent and so on. But the key thing here is the intention. What is the intention of these particular behaviours? Um, occasionally of course uh, these things might be used in the short term as uh, improving your ability to approach a particular difficult thing. So, you know, you might be using gloves um, on a one-off in order to touch the door handle, but actually the next step is to be able to remove the gloves. So if it's a means towards an end and it's something that's being used to approach um, your target, then it's not a safety seeking behavior. It's a short term thing you're doing to enhance your uh, exposure tasks as a means towards an end. And um, we have a course uh, in our anxiety of residential unit at the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, the OCD bully that was uh, devised by my colleague Steve Kaplan. And we ask our residents to place their safety objects in that uh, container in the front uh, as, as a way of trying to throw away these things which are maintaining and keeping their problems going. So in here you can see someone's thrown in a bottle of bleach, someone else has thrown in a pair of handcuffs and someone else, and all these things would be being used as safety objects and they need to go. So one of the things that can be a little tricky sometime is covert, things that you do in your head safety seeking behaviours. And examples of these are where you analyse the task or repeatedly review the evidence very carefully to make sure something's safe. You're trying to force yourself to relax and to be calm. You're using lots of affirmations like it's my OCD or telling yourself it's safe or some phrase. You're trying to distract yourself or switch yourself off sometimes. Trying to transform the image or just neutralize it to undo it and so on. And the key thing behind all these things that you're doing in your head is really to work out well what's the intention behind it? You know, is it to help me avoid and escape and feel more in control and more certain and so on? Because if it is, it's a safety seeking behavior, it's not helpful. Do you remember earlier we said it's the only thing you should really be doing in your head? is to label the emotion that these are the feelings of anxiety or disgust or whatever and encouraging yourself uh, in terms of telling yourself that yeah this is tough this is difficult but just stick with it or whatever now uh, you remember that exposure also includes response prevention now this is just a grand name really for preventing yourself from doing any of your compulsions um, and you might just think well it really is just stopping it isn't it and if you really want a nice uh, a good laugh about that uh, have a look at on the YouTube uh, Bob Newitt and stop it um, 
because he, he does take the piss out of that really um, so I think the key thing in response prevention is certainly understanding its motivation um, it's getting in the way of preventing you from discovering that actually you can tolerate the anxiety or and testing out your predictions um, so try to identify the criteria you're using to finish the compulsion um, very often it's about feeling comfortable feeling just right um, because obviously the aim is to finish when it feels uncomfortable and feel not right and you know that feeling of being comfortable and just right is very normal in some contexts. You know, supposing you're deciding who to get, you're going to get married to somebody. You know, you've got to feel comfortable. You've got to feel just right. And uh, it's not, you know, it, it, but the problem in OCD it's become problematic, and it's sort of become used for all these decisions all the time in all your compulsions. So. Even if you do manage to stop a compulsion, make sure you don't then compensate. For example, you're now avoiding touching things more because you're washing your hands less and so on. Um, when you're doing exposure, it needs to be without the ritual. Now, there are different ways of um, doing response prevention. The most common way, which is unhelpful really, is ritual reduction. In other words, you're reducing the frequency of the compulsions. This is still recommended by therapists, but it's not really that helpful. In other words, you know, you agree to reduce your compulsions from 100 times a day to 90 times a day, and you manage to do this, and everyone's very happy. Uh, but really, you're probably not learning how to tolerate the anxiety and doubts and test out your predictions from the exposure. In other words, it looks promising, uh, but really you haven't learned very much and um, people rarely manage to actually then continue to carry on just gradually reducing these compulsions. So in general, it's not recommended, in general. Um, the second way of doing things is we call ritual delay where you're delaying the compulsion and here you might be trying to should we say agree to delay it uh, to do the compulsion for half an hour or something and this can be helpful so if it's a means towards an end and you really do carry on learning that you can tolerate the anxiety and that you don't um, do the, the compulsion for some period of agreed time. The best thing to do is to do uh, exposure after the compulsion if you feel you have to do it. In other words you're spoiling what you've just managed um, to do in the compulsion. Um, so in OCD it might be uh, touching the toilet seat after you have washed your hands. In BDD, it might be making a smudge on your perfect um, piece of work that you've done on your face after a camouflage and so on. So the key thing is to spoil the compulsion that you've just done. That is the recommended approach to dealing with compulsions. Now, sometimes compulsions are habits. Um, especially when they're very involuntary, automatic, and you're not really aware of when you're doing them. So the first step is really to try and increase your awareness of when you do the compulsions. And that might involve keeping a record of the context and the sequence of events that occur up until when you do the compulsion. And in general, you're trying to find a behavior that's incompatible with the compulsion. So for example, uh, let's say you're checking a water tap then you're leaving the water tap dripping so that you know it's pretty pointless to check. So try and find something that's incompatible with the particular compulsion. So one of the compulsions is of course uh, seeking reassurance and traditionally people are told 
you know, no reassurance, this is just a compulsion. But, you know, blocking by itself is often unsuccessful because it often then becomes self-reassurance. So it is important to retry to understand the motivation behind it and whether it's really helpful. But the important thing is probably to provide an alternative. In other words, for uh, your partner or family member to be compassionate and provide emotional support, but not to discuss the content of that particular worry and equally to be able to talk to yourself in an encouraging, caring way about being understanding, but not to discuss the content. I'm going to say something briefly about mental compulsions, because I think they are more tricky. Uh, we describe these as rabbit holes. And the most important thing is probably to be monitoring yourself in terms of being aware of uh, when these you're going down those rabbit holes. Um, so you might be using a tally counter to uh, actually just press when you are going down those rabbit holes, just to increase awareness of when you're going down a rabbit hole. And, uh, and the key thing is really to spot the rabbit holes when they're coming up. So pay full attention to the world as it is, not according to how you feel. So that in theory, you can then either choose to go down the rabbit hole and see what effect it has, or just stay on track and do the things in life which are important to you despite the way you feel. I mean, you have to acknowledge this is tough, this is difficult. Um, some people like to think about their intrusive thoughts and, and worries. Um, it's just like traffic on the road. And the key thing is to try to distance yourself uh, from the traffic and just walk along the side of the road. You're aware of the passing traffic but you're not trying to control it or jump into the front of the car and, and stop it or anything because you can never get rid of the traffic. You know, only zombies don't have thoughts and things. So yeah, I, I appreciate, however, that trying to not engage with your intrusive thoughts and uh, to leave them alone is tough. It's difficult. We, we, I do understand that. So I guess one of the things I've emphasised today is uh, trying to develop self-compassion. It's about trying to help you to feel safe, to have the courage to approach difficult things. And, and in general, I think we can say the exposure is less successful if you're very critical, very shameful, got very harsh tone in the voice and so on. So compassion is all about being sensitive to suffering in yourself or others with a deep commitment to try to alleviate and prevent it. So in general what you're trying to work towards is if you know talking to yourself in a calm caring way and encouraging yourself to approach difficult situations and tolerating the distress. This is tough. We understand uh, this is very difficult but so it's a, it's a long-term project. So uh, let's think about Briefly, some of the obstacles to exposure. I'm going to describe these as some of the six C's. Uh, and these are attitudes like, I have to know for certain that harm will not occur. I have to feel in control. I have to feel comfortable before I do it. I have to have the courage before I do it. Uh, I have to have the confidence before I do this exposure. And I have to feel complete or just right before I do it. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, these are all variations of uh, putting the cart before the horse, uh, in which uh, you know you get the comfort, have the courage, feel the confidence or complete after you've done the task uncomfortably, uncourageously, unconfidently and incompletely. And the other obstacle, of course, is a sense that I have to feel in control but hopefully what you're going to be learning in one of your um, experiments is that the more you try to control or inference internal events which are not in your control, the more you feel out of control. And you know sometimes it's also external events in that, um, let's say a person with OCD vomit phobia is constantly trying to control whether they vomit or not, uh, which is not in your control. Other people are using magical thinking uh, in order to be able to try to 
influence and prevent harm from happening. And again, of course, it has no influence or control. It makes you sometimes feel more in control, but actually uh, it makes you actually more out of control in your real life. And of course, sometimes people say, well, I have to know for certain, I have to have a guarantee that what I fear will not happen. And of course, you can't have any guarantees at all. The only guarantees in life are death and taxes. And there is a third guarantee that says that you're gonna have OCD or BD for the rest of your life whilst you demand a guarantee that nothing bad is gonna happen. Um, and, uh, you know, this, you cannot have it. So, you know, finally, I guess some people might say, but I've tried it all before. And, you know, I'd say, well, if at first you don't succeed, try again, but learn from the last time. Was the exposure you did last time, was it not frequent enough, for example? Was it not challenging enough? Was it done with compulsions or safety seeking behaviors? Was it only done with lots of discussion and accompanied by somebody? Was it done with lots of reassurance? Was it done without testing out a particular theory? Uh, so that or just your ritual prevention might have been too limited or you substitute other rituals. I mean, there might be all sorts of things that might have interfered with your previous course of exposure. So I'm coming to talk now. There's all sorts of books and information out there on the internet uh, which you can get more information from. Uh, we've done some on OCD and BGD, health anxiety, and we've got new ones coming out on death anxiety and emetophobia. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, just to say, if you are ever passing through Beckenham, uh, do go and visit the Museum of the Mind, uh, which you see there on the right. Um, that's a wonderful place, in the, which is a, a museum now that uh, you can visit in the Bethlehem Royal Hospital at certain times and days of the week. Thank you.